We've crossed a breach, in other words. Now we got to find out what we're going to do on this side. The real choice is the difference between picking a road to destruction and picking a road to life. I didn't know by writing the series how blessed I would be because I preached to myself before I preached to you. And it really made me reflect on what was important and what was not important in my life. What material items I should let go of and which ones I should really direly try to find. I hope today's message blesses you. Let us pray. Lord, our Father, your words, not mine. This week was definite proof of that, for I was incapable, Lord. And you show this sinful preacher that you'll give him the message of life, even when his mind is worried about the things of this world. Lord, I ask that you open up the hearts of each person here. You knock on the doors of their hearts. Lord, allow them to open up their ears a little bit easier today. Today's message is really important. It was, it was important for me. I know it will be important for somebody before me or somebody who is watching online. But Lord, speak to us today through this Bible I hold in my hands. Allow this sinful man not to get in the way of your word. Instead, may your light shine through me as I am a piece of glass. And may you illuminate all of us today. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. May his special treasure say, Amen. Man, I have two questions for us to answer today. What do we do when we get to the other side? And what should we not do when we get to the other side? Fair enough? Two questions. The answers are here. You ready? When we get to the other side, we need to have an active faith. We need to have a living relationship. I'm going to describe what that means today. Is that fair enough? And what we should not do is we should not look back. We should not keep turning our heads and being the past and looking what we might be missing out on. We should not look back there because back there is only pain, suffering, and destruction. Amen? We need to keep looking forward. We need to press on. We need to do a marathon. We're not doing laps. We're not going to repeat. We need to look forward. You see, the reason why the uh, Israelites, once they got across that Red Sea, and the Lord actually closed off the way they couldn't get back if they wanted to. But they turned a 40-day journey into a 40-year journey because they kept looking back. There wasn't water. They groaned. There wasn't food. They groaned. There was too much light. They groaned. Their stomach hurt. They groaned. They kept looking back at Egypt. Forty days turned into 40 years. Let's not do that ourselves. I want to say let's look forward. Amen? Starting off, we need to understand one of the greatest issues about what we do after choosing Christ or like a young master guy did last week, get baptized. And that is we need that living relationship with God. A husband and wife, father and a son, a mother and a daughter, they all do the same thing. They communicate, and they spend time with one another. If they did not, what would happen to the relationship? It would die out. It would dissolve. Husband and wife might even leave one another because they're not getting the attention that they need. Now, God will never leave us, ever. He'll never forsake you. I say that week by week by week because I know it's the truth. But if we forsake God, eventually we won't be depending upon Him for courage. We'll be looking at the world for the comforts of our lives. When the days get too hard, we'll find something to distract us. 
so that the pain might be a little more livable. An active relationship means we communicate and we participate. Amen? In Psalms chapter 55, verse 22, it says, Cast your burdens on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Again, in Psalms 34, 17, the Lord says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to look at two stories and three Gospels. We're going to go into Matthew, John, and Mark in that order. Talk about two stories, one about Peter and one about another man. I'm going to call him that man. And we're going to learn what this means to when we hit the beach, to not look back. All right? Let's pick on Peter first. I like picking on Peter. Peter's awesome. He's a spokesman for the disciples. He was a student of Christianity underneath Jesus Christ himself. And in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, the Word of God says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, again, we're in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, right? His brother... They were casting nets into the sea because they were what? Pay attention to that word. They were fishermen. You know, fishermen are usually tired, annoyed, and they smell pretty funny. They smell like fish. Just like a, a shepherd smells like sheep. Right? He said to them, follow me and I will make you. That's different. I will make you fishers of men. Right? And immediately, there was no second thought, they left their nets and they followed him. Now, as Jesus led the disciples through ministry, they went through all kinds of troubles and he tried to give them courage. He tried to give them confidence in the ministry, in the power of God. He was working miracles in front of them so he can see their lives change. Amen? But he also wanted to, pre pre to prepare them for what would be the hardest day, not only of his ministry, but of their worldly lives. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, Jesus begins to show the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. He's going to suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. And then he's going to do two things. He will be what? He'll be killed. And the second thing was he'll be Raised on the third day. This was so important, he said it three times. Again, in Matthew 17, 22, he says, The Son of Man will be killed, and the third day he will be raised up. And again, Matthew 26, 31, They will strike the shepherd to kill the shepherd, right? But on the third day he'll be raised, and then I'll come to Galilee, and I'll find you. Where was Jesus going to find the disciples? In Galilee, he told them. He told him, I will be killed. He said, I will be raised, and then I'll come find you. Three times. Each time, Peter rebuked him. Each time, the disciples' hearts were sorrowful. Each time, they heard everything except for, I will be raised on the third day. They had no idea what that meant, I guess. Do we sometimes only hear the bad news? And we can't see the good news past it. Question. In John chapter 21, I moved there fast, didn't I? Jesus Christ was, and going to turn there, we'll stay there for a second. I'm not jumping all around this time. Jesus was killed as he said he was going to be killed. And on the third day, he did raise. And then guess what he did? He went to Galilee looking for his disciples, just like he said he would do, right? And where did he find Peter?
he was in the same boat that Jesus approached him on when he says, Fisherman, you're a fisherman, but I will make you a, a fisher of men. But in John chapter 21, mercy. We're going to go through this in verse 9. Actually, we'll start before then. I'll, I'll give you the context. He saw the disciples on the ship. He says, cast your net on the right-hand side because they caught nothing all night long, right? And then they, oh, what's going on here? And they, oh, they, they, they just try to pull. And then John says, it's the Lord. And Peter does the most, I don't know, he puts on his clothes and then jumps in the water. That's, 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 that's Peter. He, he swims ashore, even though it was only a short distance. He wanted to make sure that the Lord knew, I'm going to get there as quickly as possible. I have missed you. But when he presented himself to the Lord, guess what? Jesus was going to give him a hard time. You guys might not have seen this. He gave Peter a hard time. He says, you done fishing? Yeah, yeah, I'm done fishing. All right, fishermen, go pull that net up to the beach. Peter goes running over. Okay, I got the net. I'm pulling it to the beach. He is doing the chore of a fisherman, right? They have breakfast, and guess what, guess what Peter is doing while they're having brec breakfast? What is he doing? He's counting fish. You know how I know that? Because it gives a number of 153 fish to the next verse. Now, let's turn to verse 9. Here's where we get to the meat and potatoes of it all. Ready? As soon as they came on the land, they saw a fire of coals was there. What was on the fire of coals? Fish and bread. It was already cooking. Question. Did Jesus need the fish that they caught? No, he already provided for them. It was already cooked. It was ready to go. But they are one, two, three, four, five. Just count. Wow. We could catch nothing all night long, but here we got a nice catch of fish. 153 fish. That's a lot of counting. So when they had eaten breakfast, verse 15, Jesus said, Simon Peter. Simon, son of Jonah, fisherman, I put that word in there. Do you love me more than these? What do you think he was pointing at? He was pointing at the fish. I told you what was going to happen, Peter. Peter, where was your faith when it needed to be there the most? I told you I was going to die. I told you the chief priests were going to do it. And I told you I was going to raise on the third day, but you ran away. When the disciples needed you the most, you were gone. You're their leader, right? Where were you, leader? You went from a fisher of men to just a fisherman. You refused and broke the promise you made with me. Look at that fisherman. I would not want to be in Peter's shoes at that moment. Do you love me more than these? Oh, mercy. Yes, Lord. Lord, you know I love you. Hmm. Okay. Feed my lambs. You love me so much, I need you to nurture the little boys and little girls. I need you to teach them what it means to follow Jesus Christ and to look for God in their answers. Peter, I need you to keep your promises. You say you're going to do something, do it. Don't turn your back. Show the kids by a good example. Amen? Feed my lambs. 
Again a second time. Oh, poor thing. Again a second time. He says, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. Of course I love you. Tend to my sheep. Guide your brothers and sisters. Look after them. When's the last time you visited somebody that wouldn't benefit you? When's the last time you looked for an old person who, who really had no family and they could use a hug? Use a moment to say, how are you doing today? When's the last time, Peter? When you did something for somebody else instead of yourself. I need you to tend to my sheep. When the problems came this time, you went that way. You left my sheep. You left your disciples. You led a few of them back on the boat with you. You can't do that, Peter. You can't turn back. Tend. Tend to my sheep. Yes, Yes, Jesus. Third time. Do you love me? You know that I love you. Grieve to the heart. Jesus Christ was making some headway with him. Pain has to occur in here before we understand up here sometimes. Do you love me? Lord, you know all things of the world. You know my heart towards you. Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Everything you've done prior is forgiven. But now I need you to go forward and shine the light of life on all those. You learned your lesson here, right? You're not going to do it again. No, Lord, I won't do it again. Go forward. And be about my father's business. And then he told that fisherman. He says the same thing he said so many years ago. He says follow me in verse 19. Because he had to become a fisher of men once again. Once you return back to the world that's in a very dangerous spot. If you think you can live there you're wrong. You're dead wrong. But when he said, follow me, bless you. But when he said, follow me, he didn't say, now you can get behind me and walk with me. He was saying, I need you to follow my character. I need you to follow my principles. I need you to do as I have been doing on this planet for the past three and a half years. I need you to reach the unreachable. I need you to make sure that the needs are met for those who are needed. I need you to look after the widows. I need you to greet the children. I need you to gather my children as a hen would gather her chicks, Peter. Can you do that? Yes, Jesus. Follow me. Amen? Second story is going to be found in Mark chapter 5. Give you the context. We're leaving off, or we're picking up where we left off last week. Last week we were in Mark chapter 4. The disciples had a hard time in a storm. They finally met the end of their abilities and the beginning of God's capabilities. Amen. Mark chapter 5 verse 1 it says, And they came to the other side. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of God on an S. And when they had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tomb a man with an unclean spirit. Verse 3, who had his dwelling amongst the what? The tombs. And no one could bind them, not even with chains. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken to pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs. And what was he doing up there? 
He was crying and cutting himself with stones. The path to discipleship is a lifelong path. It's not a short journey. But it begins with follow me. Amen? And then we go through a few storms probably, right? But we learn a lot in that storm. I guarantee you, you learn a lot in that storm. After that storm, while following Jesus, he will lead us to a destination that he needs us to be. In other words, God places us in an environment where we must be about his business. When we follow Jesus, it's not that we follow Jesus and do nothing. When we say we're following Jesus, we're following Jesus, he's okay, here. You'll be here. Work here. Follow my example today. Amen? So, I have a question for you. They went through a storm. Twelve disciples got off the boat. One's Jesus, right? And the first thing they see is this unclean spirit, or this unclean man. And this man was unclean spirits within them. I'm getting it all confused. Do you think they were scared? Do you think they knew what to say? How are you doing? No. They had no idea what to say. They had no idea what to do. They saw a man before them with chains hanging off of him. I'm sure he wasn't freshly shaved. I'm, I'm sure he didn't take a bath last night. And I'm sure he didn't have the most pleasant look on his face. But here you have 12 petrified disciples and one confident Jesus. Amen? It's a lot of time the way ministry goes. I know my call porters, I know their first time out there, they feel much like these disciples. They have no idea what to say or do. They're like, ah, they don't look nice. Yeah. You see that tattoo on his head? Am I really going to sell this guy a book? They're terrified. There's those men in our neighborhoods here, and guess what they need? They need Jesus. I'm not saying this as a pastor. I'm saying as a, a, a lover of my neighbor. They need a light that you guys have that they're missing, right? Do you think they'd be dealing with life the way they do if they could have the truth that you have? If they had a dependable Savior they could lean upon in the time of their needs, they wouldn't have made half the mistakes. I would not have made half of my mistakes. The light came in my life at age 34. Praise God it came then, not later. I'm not sure how much more my body would have endured. But here we have 12 terrified disciples, one confident Jesus. And just as Jesus told the heart of the sea, peace, be still. He looked at this man. He looked at this man with self-inflicted wounds. He looked at this man that had many sleepless nights. He looked at this man that had a graveyard for his companions and the only people or breathing things that were around him were pigs. We looked at this man who had no help and no hope, even from his own family, which was in the village, right down the hill from them. No, he was left alone in the world. Jesus looked at this man. And he looked in his heart, and he says, Peace, be still. I need you to do something for me today. I need you to erase this man's title of demoniac. I'll tell you why. It's like a supervillain title. It gives him credit for the evil. I'm going to strip that away if you don't mind. I don't believe that evil has any power. I believe God has only power and that we give evil its power. If you strip evil of its power, it has no power because we have Jesus Christ. Amen. Instead, I want to look at his symptoms. 
I want to see if we can see if this represents our current day society, our current day world that the Lord is desperately trying to save. Remember the words of Jesus, do you love me? Tend to my sheep. And here before them was a sheep in the most critical shape. You often hear that the fields are whitened, but the workers are few. The real workers, those children of mine that should be about my business, they are sometimes about someone else's business. And that's why my workers are so few. Mercy? Mercy. The world is crying out. Here's the symptoms. The world is crying out, just like this man we read about. It is at this very moment our brothers and sisters are suffering in the world. Even after last night's events of whatever they were doing, they are suffering this morning. In the world, there are people who cut themselves because they have no other way to deal with the pain that's inside of them. And they're trying to get it out. They're lonely. Even in the midst of a crowd, they're lonely and feel isolated. There's no one that visits them while they're in distress. They're alone in their apartments, hoping for a knock on the door. But nobody has knocked on that door for years. I'm not sure if you can relate with this man that I'm talking about. But I know that the world can. I know that I can. There is no answer from the world. The world has no real concern for you or for me unless it can get something out of us. The world doesn't care about you except for what you can give it. The world is full of sadness, of anger, of envy, of covetousness. The world is selfish and bent on satisfying itself by all means necessary. This man that we talked about, who was touched by the Savior, do you know what he pleaded afterward? Let me follow you. Please let me follow you. All right, you can follow me, but the journey is very short. You're going to follow me to your town. The town that rejected you, you are going to go to. Because I'm a stranger to them, and they will not listen to me, but they will hear you. Though they are callous to my outreach, you will be able to hug them. Though the ears are stopped up to me, you can proclaim life to them. Though they will not look my direction, they will stare at you and wonder what happened. They know you, and you will testify of life to them. The next time we hear about this city, guess what? The whole, that town and the surrounding towns are converted, looking for Jesus. Why? Because this man was about his father's business. Amen? It's a living relationship. It's not an idle faith. Faith without works is. The wages of sin is. It's not enough to just love Jesus Christ. Yes, I love God with all my heart. But if I do nothing about it, I do nothing about it. Action. Put thought into action. You think it, the Holy Spirit inspired it, I guarantee it. If it's about God, it was brought to you by the Holy Spirit. Because you can think of no good thing by yourself. The same is for us. We were asked to leave the coast. Jesus said, follow me. We all agreed that day. I witnessed it. Last week we talked about the storms we're going to need to endure. 
This past week was a storm for me. It was a hurricane. My heart broke this week. I didn't, I could not open up this book and read and be read to. I'm not sure about you. When I read the Bible, it reads to me. When I'm looking at the words in red, they are speaking to me on the issues of my life. But this week was so hard. I read, and all I did was read. I could not hear the voice of God, and it scared me. For the first time, my heart was so broken. I didn't think I was going to stand before you and preach today. I didn't know what to do. When the world is too tough to stand, get on your knees. When your burns are too heavy, cast them at the altar of grace and mercy. He's willing to take them. Life's not going to be easy. I don't care how righteous you are. It's going to be hard. The storms will be there. But Jesus will get you through the storm. Just bring it to him. And after the storm, we're on the coast now. That's the day. We're on the coast. We must be about our Father's business. We can't let this opportunity just pass us by. I'm trying to light a fire in your hearts that he's been trying to ignite for years. Some people are very active. Some people have been waiting for an opportunity. Well, I'm going to offer you the opportunity, opportunity today. This series is over. I'm not going to preach about this next week. But we are going to do something next week. We're going to begin to reach out to our neighborhoods. Pastor Michael's going to do it. I know that much. I know that much. But today we try to learn about two things. You remember the two things we're going to learn about? We're going to talk about what we need to do and what we should not do. So this is a two-part appeal. I'll be very open with you. First part of the appeal. Many of us are dealing with chains. I know a chain breaker. Many of us have ropes that are tying us to the issues of this world. I know a man that can cut those ropes. Some of us have bridges in our life that are seemingly indestructible. Guess what? I know a man that can tear those bridges apart. The person who keeps an access back to his old life is planning on using it one time or another. They're going to use it if they keep it. We must destroy the bridges, burn them. We must cut the ropes and break the chains. And you cannot do it on your own, I know. It's hard. So my first appeal is if you want God to take a part in your life, if you want Jesus to come alongside you and handle the things you can't handle on your own, I'm going to ask that you stand. I'm going to ask that you stand for freedom from this world, I'm going to ask that you stand for Jesus Christ as a person who's going to be the administrator for your issues and your problems, who's going to be there during your times of grief and suffering, and who's going to help you through the storms of your life. Stand for strength in Christ who empowers us. Amen? Amen. Second part of the appeal, and this one's a little more personal. I told you, active relationship, active faith, mobile. We are going, it's not a question, we are going to go to this neighborhood and the surrounding neighborhoods. 30 minutes, maybe an hour in a day, not much time. But that investment of 30 minutes or one hour, how long we walk for or ride our cars for, I don't care, will change the life, not only of you, but of those who you come in contact with. We're going to knock on some doors. 
we're going to offer some Bible studies. They look like this. Stand for just a little bit longer, please. These are the Bible studies that brought me out of my valley. This is the light that I read that brought me into a church. I stand before you today because some man knocked on my door and gave me these Bible studies. And I made a choice on my own. You can't make a choice for them. I made a choice. You just bring the material. The appeal is this. I need volunteers. I need people who want to walk and knock on some doors as God is knocking upon their hearts. When God says, will you feed my lambs? Will you tend to my sheep? Will you feed my sheep? Do you love me? Will you be about my father's business? Those who want to be about their father's business today, I know it's not for everybody, but those who make a choice today, I'm going to ask that you come forward. I'm going to ask that you come up with me. And that you stand here, and then we're going to say a prayer for everybody here. But those who come and stand here today, I want to collect some information because I want to reach out to you, and we're going to do this. We're going to do this organized, and we're going to glorify God in doing it. Amen? I will train you. I will teach you, and it will be very simple. You can sit there and smile, or you can talk. It's only for those who want to do this, though. But I want to impact those who live in the valley of the shadow of death. I want to be a light that shines to them because God shines through me and you. Amen? And so in doing this, in doing this, you will change somebody's life forever. Of this I testify. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Lord, before me stands your army. Before me stands your children who cry out in your name for help. Lord, we come to church not to have a social committee. We come to church because we have made a decision that we want you to change our lives. But Lord, as you change our lives, may we change the lives of those around us. May we not sit by idly waiting for you to come back. Instead, Lord, may we make a choice today. We'll proclaim your message to those who we can. As Jesus sent that man into the town, that man spoke. And that man gave studies. And the effects were amazing. Lord, I ask an anointing over these who are standing before me who made a choice. Strengthen their legs, get their hands ready, and prepare their hearts. Lord, we ask that you glorify us. We send your Holy Spirit into the neighborhoods right now, even today, preparing those we come to for our visitation. Lord, even though it might be a short handing of a book and a quick prayer, Lord, we know that you'll make the most of it because they know they're cared for. May we not leave the children of this world, your children in darkness any longer. May we give them an opportunity for life, and may we do it today. Lord, also we prepared that our bodies will be changed by you today. The addictions, the pains that we're suffering, the issues of the world we're having, the health, the wealth, and the family, Lord, we bring those up to you because you know, we know you can solve them. Lay your hands over our families. Heal our bodies. And Lord, give us answers for the things that we have no answer for. Care for us. Provide for us in the way you promised in the Bible that you will sustain us. May we be your treasured people because we choose you. But you have chosen us first. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. May his children say, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen. I'm going to have.